Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to a very special webinar. Today, for the first time to our program, we'd like to welcome Deepika and Shivram to today's webinar. Hey, both, how are you guys doing? And they're both in the same room, so very nice to see you guys both here on screen together. Um, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items that we'd like to cover. First, we'd love to keep this as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions for us, please submit them using the Ask a Question tab below, and we'll get to your questions throughout today's presentation. In addition, um, we'd love to hear from you guys. So if you have any feedback, let us know how we did, how we're doing, or what you'd like to hear in, in future events by leaving us feedback, hitting the Rate This tab also below the presentation screen. So we'll be going through some slides, and we also have a live demo um, near the end of the presentation. So at any point you have any questions, um, please let us know. We're happy to answer them. Now, without further ado, let's hand this off to today's speakers. Team? Hi. Welcome to the webinar. My name is Tepika Pandi. I'm the product manager at Green Plum. Um, based out at in Palo Alto, California. So today I have uh, my colleague with me. Um, Shivram, you want to introduce? Yeah, hi, I'm Shivram. I'm the engineering manager for Greenplum, and uh, I've worked closely with Deepika for this product. Yeah, all right. So uh, this is a little housekeeping from our side. Um, so it just says like this presentation highlights various features of our product. Please be aware that these features may change or evolve over time based on the development and the industry trends. Discussing a feature doesn't guarantee its immediate or future inclusion in the product. For the latest information, refer to the official documentation and updates. Your understanding is appreciated as we strive to provide the best solutions. All right, so what's on schedule today? So we will talk about high level overview of Green Plum. Uh, for those uh, new to Green Plum, uh, this will set the stage for you um, for the entire presentation. Um, following that, we'll discuss the need of creating uh, the new disaster recovery capability for Green Plum uh, platform. In the remaining segment, we will talk about a highly anticipated Green Plum disaster recovery uh, utility. We will have the spotlight on the key features and the capabilities, walkthrough of pre recorded a demo release updates and the future roadmap and then finally we'll open it for q a okay so without further ado let's get started uh, in today's fast-paced world making informed decisions requires more than an intuition it requires a data-driven insights enter green plum a leading data analytics platform that propels your ability to uncover valuable information by processing the petabyte scale data in Greenplum's architecture, the master node serves as the conductor, managing query optimization and data distribution. It's a brain orchestrating the system. On the other hand, the segment nodes are the worker bees, responsible for storing and processing data in parallel. Think of them um, as a, a muscle behind the high performance analytics. Together, these nodes deliver seamless data processing and insights. All right, so why Greenplum created our disaster recovery tool? Now that we have set the stage with an understanding of on Greenplum platform, let's delve into a, a critical aspect, the necessity of developing this new disaster recovery capability for the platform. Uh, Greenplum's focus on disaster recovery stemmed from a range of crucial factors. Acknowledging the paramount significance of data integrity, it aimed to establish um, uh, a dependable solution uh, for maintaining data integrity in the mission critical environments. This objective extended to ensuring business continuity by enabling a seamless operations even during unexpected disasters or system failures. Furthermore, a green plum sought to minimize the downtime uh, and associated costs by introducing an efficient and streamlined disaster recovery tool. Understanding the weight of regulatory compliance, Greenplum developed a tool that assists organization in meeting the compliance requirements and adding an extra layer of uh, preparedness. Driven by customer demand, Greenplum responded to the need for the robust mechanisms to safeguard the critical data, resulting in the creation of a tool that enhances the data availability through a rapid and efficient recovery. This reflects the Green Plum's proactive approach to data management, ensuring organizations are well-equipped 
to face potential disasters and maintain accessibility and recoverability of the data. Okay, now let's talk about the, must, uh, the much anticipated green plum disaster recovery tool, how you can achieve the resilience. In a world where unforeseen dis uh, disruptions can uh, strike at any moment, the need for a reliable data recovery strategy is a paramount. Picture the scenario, um, a critical business decision hangs in a balance, but a, a disaster strikes, threatening to compromise your data and stall operations. And to green plum disaster recovery capabilities, a guardian that ensures uh, your data resilience and continuity. At the heart of this solution lies the ability to restore your green plum cluster to a precise point in time, mitigating the impact of disasters. The continuous right ahead log, which are basically the transaction log which Green Plum generates uh, uh, through all the SQL operations you do on the Green Plum cluster, like the alter table, create table, uh, insert, and updates. Achieving it achieves the mechanism ensures that your data remains seamlessly intact. And what's more, this is accomplished without causing any significant performance strain on your primary cluster all achieved without locking the database. So this is in a layman term, uh, it is called as like an online backup. Imagine having a shared central repository accessible through local file systems, NFS, S3, or GCS. This repository houses your backups and wall archives, ready to step in at moment's notice. The result, an enhanced recovery point objective, reducing the risk of data loss, from a standard 24 hours to mere sub-minute intervals. But it doesn't stop there. Greenplum's disaster recovery solution extends its protective arms to a second data center, offering a safety net against potential data center failures. With this mechanism in place, you are armed with a comprehensive strategy that ensures your data security, accessibility, and continuity in the face of adversity. Greenplum's story of a disaster recovery is one that reflects resilience, innovation, and a commitment to safeguarding your data's integrity. It's a story that enables you to navigate the uncertainties of the digital world with confidence, ensuring that your insights and operations remain unshaken regardless of the challenges that come your way. Now, uh, yeah, so in the next slide, we'll deep dive probably the steps of how you can achieve the DR. So I'll uh, uh, pass it to my colleague. So we'll share with that. Right, so <clears throat> now we'll deep dive into uh, the flow or in terms of how uh, Green Plum Disaster Recovery product would work. So the first phase would be a uh, preparation phase where step one, you'll have to provision the repository. And what we mean by repository is the central shared storage, which would be used to house both your backups and uh, all of your wall data. And as uh, said in the previous slide, we support NFS, S3, and GCS today, and we'll have more options in the future. Step two would be you'll have to configure uh, your primary cluster. What we mean by primary cluster is that's your current active cluster in such a way that it can connect to your uh, repository. And <clears throat> once the configuration is done, uh, this will also enable <clears throat> wall archive. And once the wall archive is enabled, uh, it'll continually uh, archive all the wall at the background to the repository. Step three would be uh, you would now have to configure your DR cluster to access the repository. Uh, what we mean by DR cluster is that's nothing but your recovery cluster, which will eventually like be promoted once your failover happens. Right. So as part of configuration, all you do is establish connectivity to your shared central repository. The next phase would be the phase when your actual data sync happens. This is when all the heavy lifting happens with regards to DR. So, uh, and what needs to be done as uh, a step one during the data phase is your DR cluster first needs to be bootstrapped based on the initial snapshot of your data on your primary cluster. So towards this, you need to first take a full backup of your primary cluster, and that backup needs to be restored on the DR cluster. And step two, uh, your backups will have to be, uh, then you'll have, to, you'll have options to take incremental backups and there are, the tool will also provide you options to view, monitor, and even expire such incremental backups. And there's another option to create what we call as restore points, which I'll explain in a, in a minute. And, uh, 
And on the DR cluster, uh, you have the option to choose at any point in time to restore uh, based on a specific backup label or on a configured restore point. So whatever you have taken as a backup, you have the option to restore at any given point on the DR cluster. And today we have two modes of uh, uh, two workflows in terms of deciding how to go about your DR. You could either go with the continuous workflow or you could go with an incremental workflow, which we'll explain uh, in a bit. And, uh, and during this phase, your data is continuously kept in sync between your primary and your recovery cluster. And once, say, if in, the, in the event of a disaster or if you're ready to switch over from your primary to your recovery cluster, this is where we call it as a, the promotion phase, right? So during the promotion phase, we'll run the promote command, which promotes the DR cluster. And at this point, you're no longer listening to changes on your primary cluster. You're not any longer in recovery mode. And once you're promoted, you have the option to start and run queries, and you can also add your mirrors and make it your primary cluster. Uh, one fundamental concept that, we'll be, that we have in the product is this thing called resto points. Why do you need resto points? The main reason for this is uh, that's the fundamental means based on which we would uh, ensure that all the segment data is backed up in a consistent state, and which is key to an MPP product. Right? There's no point just backing up data from individual segments if you're not able to restore them onto a particular consistent point. And uh, these restore points are always taken automatically whenever we take an incremental backup, or a user can also choose to create a restore point at any given point. Right? So now let's uh, move on to uh, dive deep in the, into the two workflows, which I just discussed uh, a minute back. So you have the option to choose either uh, enable your recovery using the incremental workflow, or you could go with the continuous workflow. And I'm just going to compare and contrast uh, the, the, the differences between these two workflows. So to start with incremental workflow, the foundation of how the DR using an incremental workflow would work is it's based on files in your data directory. So everything that's stored on your segments, your data directory and your configuration files and all of that would be backed up as part of this workflow. And the approach here is your clusters uh, cluster will be incrementally backed up and that data will be incrementally restored on the DR side. And what happens on the backup, right? So during backup, uh, every single time you issue an incremental backup command, uh, every file on your primary cluster with a changed size or changed timestamp compared to what was previously stored in the shared storage, shared repository, that would be sent over and uh, to be synced, right? And that, that could be done using this command called GPCR backup uh, with the incremental type. And on, on the restore side, uh, what you do is you would just restore the incremental backup associated with that particular uh, label or a, a restore point. And it'll essentially copy all the data incrementally and apply it on the DR cluster. Uh, in terms of RPO and RTO, which are like the, the most key buzzwords in the world of DR, uh, what we, in terms of RPO, this uh, it's hard to achieve an RPO that's very low. Uh, it generally tends to be medium to high, which means uh, you'll relatively have a, a higher data loss, low, medium to high data loss, based on how frequently you take incremental backups. Typically, incremental backups are not the quickest operation, so and uh, customers would be using this every hour or every day, depending on their uh, their needs. And then similarly on the RTO, uh, in terms of time it takes to recover the DR cluster, this is also medium. In terms of storage, uh, this is again medium to high because here you'll have to not just house the full backup, you also need to store all the wall data and all the incremental backups that you take after you've taken the full backup. And in terms of uh, using your DR cluster, right, uh, when, uh, when it's in recovery mode, you can promote the DR cluster and use it for read-only queries as long as you're not actively restoring. So this is pretty seamless where you could query it and then take it down and continue restoring data. Now to contrast this with the continuous workflow, which is something that we just recently developed, uh, the continuous workflow is based only on wall, wall data, right? And we're not dealing with any files on disk. So in this case, the approach here is your wall is just archived to the repository and they are replayed on the DR cluster. So what it means in terms of backup, right? So no new, the user doesn't have to issue any backup command as the wall is always archived in the background, right? And they're sent to the repository. And uh, what the user needs to do here is all they need to do is run the command called GPCR create restore point. 
And uh, this is a very, very lightweight operation. And this is the means based on which you can guarantee that all the wall data that has been archived can be consistently recovered on the DR cluster, right? And as I said, this is a very lightweight operation. So you're allowed to do this very, very frequently to get to achieve a very low uh, data loss. And in terms of restore, what happens is all we do is we just pull and replay any new wall that has been generated between the most recent, uh, the chosen restore point and the previous restore that happened, right? So, and if you do restores frequently, the amount of wall that needs to be pulled and replayed is very minimal as you're not dealing with files or differences uh, or data directories here. In terms of RPO and RTO, uh, you, can, you can actually achieve a very low RPO. What low RPO means is your data loss could be as minimal uh, or next to zero. In, and that would be based on how frequently you create your restore points. Right? So the more frequently you do it, the, the you can minimize the data loss. And in terms of RTO, your recovery is a lot faster because you're just, just dealing with replaying wall, which is very efficient. And that's how mirrors are kept in sync today with the primaries on, a, on the regular cluster in Greenplum. In terms of storage, your storage footprint is very low because all you're dealing with is the initial full backup. Uh, and then it's just all that wall that it gets accumulated over time, right? And which we will be which will be evicted during the process of uh, replay as well. You don't have any incremental backups, or additional data directories to keep in sync. And uh, in terms of using your DR cluster, uh, you can uh, technically switch it to a promoted state and query. But it's uh, it would be a relatively more expensive operation in terms of time to take it back from a promoted state back to the continuous recovery mode. So that's how we uh, you would compare and contrast the two workflows. Now to give you more shape and size to what I've discussed here, let's move on to a demo. Uh, and here I'll be discussing both the workflows here, right? So just bear with me for a second. All right. So on the left, left side, what we have is we have a, a primary cluster, right, which is your active cluster. And on the right side will be everything, all operations that will be carried out on, on the recovery cluster, also known as your DR cluster, right? So now uh, let me just show you, these are the commands that you would see uh, when you type GPCR help. And just to go over, and this, is, this would be very much in lines with the slide where we had the high level flow. You have commands such as configure, which is allowed, uh, which makes allows you to configure your GPCR again on the, both your primary cluster and your recovery cluster. And then you have commands to backup. You can restore data. You can promote a, the DR cluster from recovery mode to an active state so that you can query. And then you can create restore points. And this is to make sure that your uh, data is now consistently archived and could be replayed onto a consistent state. And this is something that could always be done in the background. And then there's, there are commands to get all the, the list, the info of all your backups that have been created. And then you could expire, you can monitor. So and let's, I'll walk, walk through these commands, right? So step one, as I said, uh, so we have a bunch of templates here. And what do we mean by templates, right? So uh, as discussed earlier, we support multiple types of storage. Uh, and the ones that you would see here are GCS, anything that's any file system that's compliant with the POS6 uh, file system, and then S3. These are the three types that we support, right? And we have configuration templates, which you could reuse to configure accessing your uh, repository, right? And now I'm using one such template, and I'm going to show you how that configuration file would look like. So this one here is a configuration template that we use to uh, where your repository happens to be Google Cloud. GCS, Google Cloud Storage. And as you see here, the type is GCS. Uh, and then here you have options to configure a GCS bucket and then your GCS key, uh, which would be a JSON file. And then last but not the least, uh, your path, right? And there are many more options that are available, but I'm just, I'm just showing you the most uh, minimal uh, options that are required to be configured. And once you configure this, you can now, you're now in a position to now issue a configure command, right? So what happens here is uh, when we configure, now what we're doing is on the primary cluster, we're configuring the cluster so that it can, it can start backing up data onto your GCS repository, right? And what happens behind the scenes as part of configure is first, uh, we create a bunch of configuration files and make all the segments aware of the fact that it can now connect to the repository. And now the next step is uh, what you see here is configuring GPDB GUX. So what happens here is you now 
enable the notion of wall archive in Greenplum so in the core Greenplum server, right? So the moment this is done, uh, any wall that's generated and created with insert and alter table queries or DDL, that would start automatically be uh, archived and pushed to the repository in the background, right? You don't need to do any any you don't need to synchronously run any command. It, it's just a background operation once wall archive is configured. Right. And as part of this, it restarts Greenplum, so it takes a little bit of time. And then once that's done, uh, there's additional configuration that's enabled across the cluster, and then you're done. Right. So now your primary cluster is fully configured to access the repository, and wall archive has also been configured. Step two is now if you look on the right side, which is your recovery cluster, you do something similar where you configure the cluster for the, uh, to be able to start restoring data. Right. And what you provide here is the first one is the same configuration file so that you can access the GCS repository, uh, what we call as GCS config file. And the second uh, option that you provide is your DR clusters, uh, your segment layout, right? So you, you, you need to provide the cluster configuration in terms of how many segments you have, which hosts they are located on, what are the data directories, so on and so forth, right? And once you provide those two, uh, it now configures the DR cluster uh, for the purpose of recovery. And then the configuration files are dispatched and distributed across all the segments on the DR cluster. And now we have enabled the DR cluster for uh, listening to, uh, to the repository. Uh, let's move on. And now we're going to go ahead to running the first full backup operation, right? Like as I said earlier, irrespective of which workflow you use, whether you use incremental or continuous, you have to bootstrap the DR cluster based on a full backup, right? So for this, you have to uh, take a backup with type full. Right? And this indicates that you're taking a full backup of the database, which would be all the segment files and all the data directories are backed up. Right? And uh, this would be a long running operation. Uh, and so that, and for that towards that, we have a monitor uh, command, which allow, allow you to track the progress of the full backup operation. Right? And here you would see there's progress that's tracked across every single segment. And, uh, and you could watch uh, as the backup is in progress. And all of this data has been backed up to the GCS repository. And now the backup is done. And uh, and what you also notice here is uh, a, a resto point is created at the end of the backup, right? And this would allow you to eventually now choose to restore data based on this given resto point. That's how a backup is now labeled, right? So it has a one-to-one -one mapping between a backup and a given restore or recovery point, right? which you see here on the left side. And uh, so now let's move on to the DR cluster. And so here, if you look at the GPCR info on the right side, what you would see is uh, you would see uh, the list of all backups that are currently available in the repository, right? So, and uh, what, the, what you would see here is you would see the full backup, uh, which has a particular label, and it's the same label as what you see on the left side. And you also see the associated resto point, right? Which is the means based on which you would eventually do restores, right? And uh, as a benefit, you also see what timestamp the backup was taken, right? Uh, there are, you could also see further details using the detail flag. Uh, and for, for now, we're just focusing on the high level info, right? So let's move on. Uh, so we know that we have a full backup. Let's go on to the DR cluster and let's try now, let's go ahead and try to restore that full backup, right? And as I said just now, you would restore the full backup based on the given restore point. Right, and uh, the restore is done, uh, and now you have the full backup that's fully available on the DR cluster. Next step uh, is we are now taking an incremental backup, right? Because as I said, we're now demonstrating the incremental workflow. So what we've done is uh, the full backup initially already had hundred rows, right? So I'm adding hundred more rows to. Uh, let me just go back in time a little bit. Right, so I'm adding 100 more rows to my database. So now at this point, I have 200 rows in the cluster, on the primary cluster. And now I've, on the left side, I've issued an incremental backup, right? And here you can see that by the type here, which is incremental, right, as opposed to full, right? So the inc incremental backup is in progress and it has a backup label that's generated. And then there's also a restore point that's automatically created as part of the incremental backup. And, uh, and now it's, it's making its way into the repository and the backup is done, right? Now on the DR side, 
we are now restoring the incremental backup, right? So previously we had chosen the resto point, right, associated with the backup. You also have the option to just simply choose latest, right? Latest would mean just resto whatever the last generated resto point, right? Which in this case you know the last resto point was the most recent incremental backup, right? So that's just to make your life easy so that you don't have to uh, keep tabs of the resto point, right? So and then you choose latest for this thing, and then that goes on and uh, restores the incremental backup. Just to reiterate here how this works behind the scenes, as I said previously, uh, it checks for all incremental backups is based on any files that are changed on the primary cluster, which in this case, in, we have inserted 100 new rows. So all the tables which have been updated, only those modified files on disk would be sent over to the repository. And on the DR cluster, those modified files would be uh, brought back onto the DR cluster and it would be updated. Right. And now that the incremental restore is done, Let's now try to do, uh, let's try to validate our data, right? So for you to now check or query the cluster or even make it an active cluster, you need to run promote. So you promote the recovery cluster, you wait for all the segments to come up. And once you're up, so it needs to bootstrap and then you would find uh, information like, you now for you need to start the cluster, right? So you're prompted to, uh, you prompted on what the master data directory, which now is called coordinated data directory, and then the PG port. So once you set the master data directory in PG port, and you now can be sequent to your DR cluster, and uh, and you can run queries against it, right? So and as as I said earlier, we had hundred rows in the full backup, and we've added hundred more rows. So now we have two hundred rows in total on the DR cluster. And just to validate that, let's check the number of rows in the primary cluster. Right? So we have two hundred rows here. So, and now you're in, now that you've uh, done your incremental backup, your clusters are now completely in sync, right? And uh, so now to move on, uh, for you to continue restoring, you need to make sure that you stop the cluster, right? You cannot restore an active state. That's why we'd be doing a GP stop on the DR cluster on the right side. And once the cluster is stopped, uh, you can now go ahead with few more operations, right? So I've, I've moved slightly further ahead in time. What I've done, uh, in the background is I've, I've taken another full backup, right? So what you would see here on the left is the first full backup is what you had, what was initially taken. And then we had an incremental backup, right? Which you see here. And uh, and as discussed earlier, every single backup has an, a restore point that's automatically created. And I've also taken a full backup, right? Uh, which I've not shown in the video, but it was taken behind the scenes. And that's noted here. So now at this point, you have the option to expire backups, right? So obviously, we don't expect you to take backups over and over and keep housing all of them in the repository because space comes at a premium. So you do have the option to expire based on a given backup label. So in this case, since I have a new full backup, uh, I just want to expire the, the older backup, right? So what I would say here is I would say GPCR expire and choose the very first full backup to expire, right? And what that would do behind the scenes is it expires not just the backups, but all the associated wall data that was archived after that's along with that backup. And also all the incremental backups that were generated based on that full backup. So in this case, we have one incremental backup that we had taken. So that would also be evicted from the GCS repository, right? So that's in progress and now the backup has been expired. So now at this point, we just have one full backup on the shared repository, right? And we can confirm that here. So now let's move on. And uh, what we can now see is I've again moved further ahead in time. What I've done here is I've inserted 100 more records, so which now takes the number of records uh, count to 300, right? So uh, taken a big switch from the incremental workflow. Now I want to demonstrate how the continuous workflow would work, right? So my DR cluster is now reset on the right side. On the left side, I've added 100 more rows to an already existing database of the primary cluster, which has 200 rows. So now I have 300 rows in total. And uh, what you would do for an inc for the continuous workflow, right? So here, every single time you want to propagate changes to your DR cluster, all you need to do is just create restore points. You don't you don't need to create incremental backups anymore, right? And this is a very very lightweight operation here, and this is just to make sure that your wall data is now consistently available to be replayed on the DR cluster. So uh, towards this, I've, I've run the command called gpcr create restore point, right? 
And once that's complete, uh, so what you'd see here is on the right side, you have the DR cluster where uh, you now say restore and you choose type as continuous, right? Previously we had seen incremental and now we are choosing the continuous workflow to restore uh, the new data that has been generated, which in this case was 100 new rows, right? And uh, I'm just using my restore point as latest, right? Because this was the most recent restore point that was created. Uh, and this is a very, very lightweight operation because all we do here is we don't have any files to pull. All we have to pull here as part of restore is just the new wall that has been generated between the last restore point and the current restore point, right? So it's a very quick and lightweight operation. So we pull the wall and we replay the wall and the cluster on the DR side is now up to date. Right. And now I'm going to, so now at this point I have 300 rows. I'm going to add a uh, hundred more rows just to uh, walk through this workflow again. Right. So we're now inserting hundred more records and uh, I'm creating another resto point, right? Because I want to make sure that could be consistently replayed on the DR side. So, and now created a resto point and that's now pushed to the repository. And on the DR cluster, now if you look at info, you would see here that you have three restore points, right? The very first restore point was the one that's automatically created with the full backup. The second one was the, the restore point that was previously created in which we have already restored, as you see in the command above. And then the last one that you see is the most recent restore point that was just created, right? Uh, ending with 51R, right? And now let's try to restore the most recent restore point, right? Where all we do here is we just incrementally pull and apply all the most recent wall. And uh, that's done and the DR cluster should be now up to date, right? So at this point, uh, what we should be expecting is 100 more records. So we should be having 400 rows in total. So let's now promote the cluster, right? So that we can query. And now we'll start up the cluster, the DR cluster. And uh, well, let's just check for record count. We have 400 rows and let's validate on the primary cluster. Yes, oh, we are completely in sync, right? So that's like a quick demo in terms of how the incremental and continuous workflow work. I'll and quickly transition to how the repository would look like, right? So we have been talking about the GCS repository all this time. So, and this is like a Google Cloud console, which you could use to see how your backups would be stored, right? So here, uh, the DR demo is your bucket name and demo is the path. These were the configurations that you had keyed in when you had configured your DR, right? So if you want to drill down into, in terms of how the layout looks like, every single segment has a directory, right? So these are uh, dpseg1 would be a master slash coordinator, seg0, seg1. They all have a one-to-one -one mapping. In this case, we have three segments and one master. And, uh, and here, what you would notice is your backup and your archive are two separate directories. So archive would house all of your wall data and backup would house your full and your incremental uh, backups, right? Your actual data files on disk, right? So let's look into one of the archive uh, directories. I'm looking into segment zero. And what you would see here is all the wall files that, uh, that have been generated on that particular segment, right? So these are all compressed and tarred, sorry, uh, gzipped. And uh, just to save up space, and that's all the data in the archive. Now let's switch over to the backup directory uh, on to segment zero. And what you'll see here is one full backup, right? Because we evicted the previous full backups, and we just have one full backup. And if we drill further down to the full backup, what you'll see is the exact layout on your segment on disk, right? You'll see your configuration files, your C log, your distributed log, and all your base files. So uh, it's pretty much how your file system would look on your segment, right? It's the same layout here, except that everything is compressed, right? So the last thing I would like to show here is uh, a help menu again, just to dis discuss like all the configuration knobs that you have that we have provided here as part of uh, backup, or for that matter, even restore. So there are some really good uh, knobs available to further tune and make your backup process go much faster. Uh, more prominent ones here are the process max. So when you're taking backups, yes, by default, they are done concurrently across all the segments and your coordinator. 
But if you set your process max, that allows you to further increase your concurrency to make your compression and transfer use multiple more processes, right? So if you have more cores or virtual cores, you have the option to set your process max to four or six to further increase your backup speed. And you can do the same on the restore side as well, right? Uh, using GPC or restore. Uh, general recommendation is don't go too high uh, on the backup because this is run on a primary cluster. You don't want uh, too much CPU to be consumed on your, on your primary cluster, but on a recovery cluster, you could go as high as possible and consume all the bandwidth. The other flags available are your compression knobs. So you, you, we currently support GZIP, ZSTD, and a few more. And you could configure your compression level. Uh, and then you can also set a compression network level settings. And uh, last but not the least is uh, flags which are related to bundling. What bundling allows you to do is like, in many cases, your file systems that you use to store your uh, backup data, which could be GCS, or maybe eventually we'll have data domain, and there's NFS as well. Uh, they are not necessarily optimized for very small files, right? Which you would, which you could possibly have sometimes in Greenplum when you have especially a lot of partitions uh, and heap tables, or even if you're dealing with a lot of configuration files on day on disk. So this with bundling, what you could do is you could set like a minimum size of a file, and the smaller files are now combined together, and that way you have lesser number of files stored in the repository. Right? That way you have lesser overhead in terms of number of files to maintain overall in the storage, and this further increases your performance for both for your backup and your restore operations. So yeah, so that is uh, like a quick demo and all the options that we have available. So now let's transition back to the slides. Right. So Devika. Yeah. Continue. OK, thank you. That is, thank you so much for the detail, Shivram. That was like so much techy stuff. Yeah. Just go back to our slides. Uh, give me a minute. Okay. All right. So Greenplum offers multiple data recovery mechanisms, right? All of them serve to safeguard your data, but they operate in a different ways and address different needs. In this slide, we'll compare um, a very uh, like we'll compare Green Plum disaster recovery with GP backup and GP restore. Uh, that is like the widely used uh, data recovery mechanism. Uh, if you are existing customer of Green Plum, uh, you will be already familiar with GP backup and GP restore. So we'll showcase how it is different uh, here. So let's say let's talk about in terms of the the number of segments on primary and the DR side. With Greenplum disaster recovery, it has to be same. Uh, but with backup and restore, it can vary. So you can have different configurations with primary and the DR. In terms of the type of backup, Greenplum disaster recovery will always take up physical backups. It's always like on the files in the data directories, file-based backups. But in GP backup and GP restore, it's a logical. So it uses copy from, copy to SQL-based commands to uh, do a backups. And Let's talk about on the impact of primary cluster. I think we have already talked about in the previous slides, but uh, like in terms of uh, what is the main uh, impact, right? So on disaster recovery side, so on the green from disaster recovery, we have a load, load disk and the network to move data. So this is required just to move the files to your repository. Uh, but on backup and restore, we there's a medium high impact on the primary cluster because it compete for resources. There's a SQL based locking. In the Green Plum disaster recovery side, so there is no database lock. We do not take any database locks. There is a very lightweight lock uh, uh, on the wall side, but it's not a DB lock, right? Uh, and then for the incremental DR in Green Plum disaster recovery utility, we have a full support for the incremental DR. Where in the backup and the restore, it's the partial data only mode during the restore for EO. Uh, and in, in, in terms of speed, uh, so this is our initial performance numbers which we have uh, uh, run. So the full backup is 75% faster. Uh, full restore is like 250% faster. And subsequent restores, as you have seen, if you are using the continuous wall, it's, it'll be very, very fast because it'll just pick the walls which are getting generated and just replay on the DR side. On the backup on the restore side, it'll be a little slower because it's a lot of database queries. 
and a DDL uh, subsequent like restores are not as fast as DR as well. Uh, in terms of object fil uh, object filtering, the green film disaster recovery, uh, there is no mechanism to filter any objects. Like you can uh, filter on the schema table level. So it has to be a full cluster backed up and restore. Uh, on the GP backup side, yes, there is a filtration. You can do it by database schemas and the table level. Uh, in terms of database availability, when you uh, while recovering on the DR side, uh, currently, it is offline for Green Plum disaster recovery. When we work in our future phases, uh, uh, we'll work on the different uh, uh, ways there. But right now, it'll be offline. In GP backup and GP restore, right now, it's like database will can be online while it is recovering the uh, DB. Uh, on the primary DR GP versions, uh, Green Plum disaster recovery has the uh, has a limitation on the major version should miss uh, should match. It's either GP6 or GP7, whatever you'll be using. But on GP backup and GP restore, uh, it works across major versions, 5, 6, and 7. Now let's talk about the release. So this product we launched, the first beta version we launched back in um, September last year. Um, so right now it's still in beta. So we are planning a GA for this product in October 2023. Uh, so right now on this slide, you'll see uh, if you want to play with the beta version, if you are a licensed Green Plum user, it's available on uh, VMware Tanzu network. Uh, the links are here. We'll share it offline as well. And the documentation uh, is available, VMware Green Plum Disaster Recovery. If you search for Green Plum uh, Recovery uh, on Google, you will hit this link as well. Let's talk about the version details. Right now, we are in beta 4 version, which we uh, released like two weeks back, and which required a minimum Green Plum version 6.25.1. And uh, it's also available on uh, seven uh, GP7 beta 2. Um, uh, and as we all know, GP7 GA is upcoming. So uh, it's, uh, right now, it's available. The base version for GP7 is G, uh, beta 2. The OS version which we support is RHEL 7 RHEL 8 uh, for this tool. The RHEL 7 works with 6. Um, for RHEL, uh, uh, RHEL 8, uh, it works with the 7, GP7 version. All right. OK. So now in our post GA roadmap, we are exploring the following enhancements for Green Plum disaster recovery. Uh, so first one is the incorrect archive location uh, that will strengthen the data security by encrypting the data at rest in the archive. Uh, right now, we only support uh, limited rep repositories, like the, we already talked about S3, GCS, local file system, NFS. So there's a plan to support data domain Azure as well. Uh, another feature which uh, I will be exploring up post year is the differential backup. It's basically restart the incremental backup from the latest full backup. Um, and we'll have more extensive monitoring on the restore, stri restore side. Right now, uh, we have available on the backup side. Failover and fail back. Um, it's a developer utility. We'll be developing a utility like which is capable of seamless failover and fail back operations. Uh, right now, it's all manual, but will be documented in our documentation. Yeah. The next one is the block level incremental backups. It's similar to incremental backups, but copies only modified blocks. Uh, faster DR mirror bootstrapping. Uh, this will expedite the bootstrapping of disaster recovery mirrors for uh, uh, for a quicker recovery, and and it will also reduce the overall RTO. Uh, and the last one is the hot standby, which is read only query capability on the DR cluster uh, without a promotion. So it'll just like um, it'll offer a only query capability on the DR cluster without the uh, need of promotion. So these potential additions to our roadmap uh, reflect our dedication to enhancing Green Plum disaster recovery solution, ensuring that your data remains secure, accessible, and resilient against unexpected challenges. Uh, with that, um, I think we are we can open it for Q and A. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Deepika, to get you around for today's presentation and for today's demo. Um, we'll give it a few seconds to see if any questions are coming in, but I do just want to plug in our some of our big events that we're that are coming up right around the corner. Um, the first one um, and the big one being Spring One at VMware Explorer and VMware Explorer. 
Um, Divika, will you be presenting at Explore or will you be attending the events um, this month? Yeah, so we'll be attending it. Uh, there's no presentation plan for me, but I'll be attending it. Yeah, right. Excellent. Excellent. Um, if you guys have any questions, please submit them here. But again, if you don't have questions here for today's presentation, Dipika will be at VMware Explore. So if you do see her, you can ask her there in person. Um, and please attend the many sessions that we have from, from our team. Um, and, and any questions that you have, we'll be having future sessions for webinars, highlighting some of those sessions from VMware Explore. Um, it doesn't look like we have any questions that are coming in here. So I do want to just give a special thank you to you. Dipika and Shivram, who I think probably stepped away to the side, but we do appreciate you both. <laughs> do appreciate you both jumping on today for today's presentation, for today's demo. This has been recorded and will be available on demand. And if you have any questions post-event, submit them through the uh, Ask Some Questions tab and I'll get them to our speakers here. So again, special thank you to um, you both for presenting and most of all, thanks to all of you guys for attending. Uh, we hope to see you guys at our next event. We hope to see you guys at VMware Explore. Thank you all. All right. Bye. Well, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.